Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Kling Spores Tech Talk. I'm Nick DeMars and we have with us today Chris Smith. Uh, Chris is from Kling Spores Woodworking Shop, our sister company. And in a past life, or a past part of life anyway, Chris has been a wide belt technician. Uh, he's been very valuable in, when it comes to diagnosing some problems we've seen here at, in the technical department. And uh, we thought we'd uh, set him down here today, grill him, try to make him sweat a little bit, make him work. We know he doesn't do that a whole lot, so mm. we'll just uh, we'll give him a little push today and, and see what comes out. But uh, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, the last time we were together, we dug into this a little bit, and we did have a technical malfunction toward the end, so we didn't get to quite finish up. But uh, we thought it would be prudent to bring Chris back here and uh, uh, pick that brain some more and see what, uh, see what we can get. Um, I want to remind you, if you have questions you'd like to send in and, and you'd like to have us answer on the program, send them in to techtalk at clingspore.com. Uh, and we will get to them. We're, we're alternating basically uh, metal uh, content and wood content from episode to episode. So it might be two contents down the road when we answer your wood question, but hang in there with us. We'll get to it. We promise we won't leave you hanging. So Chris, let's get right to it. Uh, we had a question on our last episode we didn't quite get to because of the uh, technical difficulty. And uh, so we thought, I thought we'd just go ahead and jump into that uh, today. Pete Davidson, asks, I've been running a wide belt for a long time, but recently a new operator sanded a workpiece with glue present on the surface. The belt is running darker lines and not sanding level, leaving raised streaks. This is a brand new belt. Is there any way I can remove the glue on the surface? Um, the first thing you need to do is remove the glue from the surface of the wood before you pass it through. That'll help prolong the life of the belt and help prevent some of that loading. Um, sometimes if it's minimally applied, you can do some things to remove that glue. However, if uh, it's start where it's turned black on the abrasive, it's sort of welded itself, if you will, to that backing. And it's, it's tough to get off. Uh, I know you in, in hindsight, uh, the only other thing you could really do is maybe shift your part and try to avoid that line so you don't completely waste your material. Uh, but if that's not the case, if that's not possible, then um, you might try, depending on what kind of material it is, if it's a cloth belt, you can take it off and try a, a pressure washer. Uh, if you go that route, make sure that you leave that thing uh, hanging to dry before you reuse it. Make sure it's thoroughly dry. Uh, the, most of those backings aren't waterproof, so they're not designed to be used with water. But in some cases, you can pressure wash them off, leave them to hang, and sometimes that fixes the issue. But again, if it's if it's welded on there due to the heat from the glue and the abrasive, uh, sometimes it's, it's very hard to get that off. Now, I think probably the, the biggest point to take out of what you just said is the fact of removing the glue before it gets into the sander. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we're doing that, is it important to try to remove 100 percent or is there a certain, you know, you can maybe you can leave a little bit. What do you think about that? Well, there's, there's several trains of thought, and a lot of times it comes down to your process of assembly. Uh, when you clamp things up, naturally, the glue is going to bubble up. What a lot of people do is they'll swipe that, that joint with their finger. Well, what that does is it presses that into the wood fibers, and it creates a wider area of glue surface than if you just let it bubble up naturally, and then literally just take a scraper and do that. All those little bubbled up areas of glue will snap right off. Uh, so if you can do it that way, that's more effective than, than making, making your life even worse by creating a, a wide bed of glue. And it's interesting we talk about this. I was recently at a cab large cabinet shop and they were having this same issue. Mm -hmm. And they're wondering what can we do to avoid this? Well, the first thing I noticed when I walked in was there was a used wide belt in the dumpster mm -hmm. and it had a wide glue line that had been mm -hmm. glazed right into place. And so we addressed that right away with them and they started a new procedure where the uh, people that are sending the work pieces to the machine are removing the glue before it actually gets to the machine operator. Yeah, and that just, it's a small, quick step. But, you know, if you think of the few seconds it takes to, to literally hit that with a scraper to knock those bubbles out, um, the money it saves you on wide belts and, and effort, and then you having to, re to not only lose the price of the wide belt, but you also lose the man hours of having to replace that belt with a new belt. So you, you, you made your machine completely down. So if you just took those five seconds, knocked them off with a scraper, then sent them through, uh, it would certainly save you a lot of time and money on parts, labor, and everything else. Absolutely. Uh, 
So uh, I know the last time we were together, we talked a bit about some of the maintenance things you can get, mm -hmm. but uh, we didn't get too deep into it. So talk a little bit about common maintenance items that shouldn't be neglected as far as wide belt machines go. Well, it, it's real easy, especially in a production shop, to neglect those maintenance issues that you need. Um, to Making sure your rollers, there's no damage to the rubber, uh, making sure your platens are in good condition, uh, making sure your conveyor belt is in good shape, um, inspecting it for cracks. The, those things are, are crucial to the main to the machine itself, making sure that it's running efficiently. Uh, but also a lot a lot of times people take for granted that if this is your wide belt and this is your workpiece and you're passing your workpiece right down the middle every time, what happens is it creates um, a concave shape on your drum. So your drum's no longer true. And so because of that belly that it's created, your piece then will come out sort of that as, as in an arc, meaning that the center is not going to be the same thickness as the sides are. And in wood, you, you typically aren't going to notice that unless you're gluing up multiple parts. And if you're gluing, if you're, if you're sending thin stock through there or narrow stock through there, the parts in the middle aren't going to be the same thickness as the parts on the end. So keeping a good check on your drums and rollers for the, that natural wear, ideally what you'd want to do is pass a part down through the right, pass a part down through the left. And if you're if they're narrow parts, then you just stagger them as, across the entire surface of the conveyor. That's utilizing the entire belt, which does a couple of things. One, it helps make, continue to make even wear on the, on the parts, on the internal parts of the machine, but also it guarantees you're using more of the abrasive belt across the whole span. Uh, by staggering it that way, it also reduces heat. So you're not constantly feeding parts through the same area on the belt. So it's going to make your belt last longer, cut better, and it's going to make your machine overall perform a whole lot better in the long run without any potential errors. Mm. And it's real easy to get into a, a niche where when you're operating one of these machines, passing a bunch of pieces through just as fast mm -hmm. as you can, get them right down the center. Yep. So it's got to be a, a conscious effort to, to spread those things out and use that entire machine. Well, it, it comes down to really training. If, if you if you train your operator to one, don't take off too much, and two, be conscious about where you place your parts on the conveyor. Uh, I mean, once once they have that muscle memory of doing that, mm -hmm. it'll just make sense. Now, if you're just doing wide parts all the time or big face frames through there, obviously it's a little harder to stagger. But still, maximize the yield on that, and you'll find that your your machine will run a whole lot better long term. Absolutely. And since we're on the subject of maintenance, uh, Chris was kind enough to send us a few pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to take a look at these pictures. To start off with, you've got this diagram. And we talked a little bit about material re removal mm -hmm. at various grits. Uh, give us a little bit of insight into that. So traditionally, a wide belt, depending on how many heads it has. I mean, if it's a single head machine, you're only going to remove whatever the amount based on the grit you have on there. I mean, and that's the biggest thing I see in, as a lot of operators, they try to take off too much at one time. Um, <clears throat> you're not dealing with a blade that's long, you're dealing with a with abrasive belt that has a grain exposure. Mm. And that grain exposure, typically based on the grit, isn't going to cut but so far before you're, you're into the backing itself. So understanding how much removal each grit can do is crucial before you even set that up. I mean, for instance, uh, 80 grit, you're only looking at you know, 24 thousandths of an inch um, maximum depth of cut. So what you want to do is keep that in mind if you're using an 80 grit or a 120 or a 180, knowing that the, the finer you go, the less removal you can perform. I mean, a 150, you're only going to get about six, six or seven thousandths of, of removal there. So knowing that sequence and, and what you're asking it to do is crucial to be able to maximize not only the belt, but get the best result on the wood surface, which is okay. the end goal. Interesting. Uh, our second picture we have there, you entitled platen issues. Can you tell us a little bit about that picture? It, for those sanders who use a platen on the final head, or if it's a combination machine that has a platen intermixed with that, what I see a lot of times is you might get little faint streaks at the end on your workpiece, um, and if you're not taking care of your platen, i.e. The, the graphite roll that, that covers it or the felt that's underneath it, sometimes you might, you might get one that uses cork. But most modern machines are using felt with the, that's wrapped by graphite uh, strip. And so understanding that if, if you're not checking that graphite, 
that can create some problems. And we talked about removal rates. Graphite, if you're using that platen head with the graphite coating, you should never be asking that to remove more than about two thousandths of an inch. And typically, if you're going to use the, the platen, it's going to be on 150 and above, generally 180, but 150 and above is where that needs to be used at. If it's uh, 120 or less, don't bother with the platen. It's really not going to get you anything. Uh, what that does is it offers a softer, wider contact point, whereas your rollers are typically a harder rubber or a metal durometer. Um, the hardness level will vary to, to, to more towards the front of the machine or the more aggressive you ask it to do. Those will be a harder durometer. So that, that platen is completely different. It's designed to be a finishing phase only. One thing, one interesting thing I read too, as far as the platen is concerned, is that when you're using a platen over a contact roll, mm -hmm. it increases the length of each individual scratch. Mm -hmm. And so I could see where that could be advantageous in the finishing process. Yeah, and that's the reason why you don't use it for anything more than the finishing process. I mean, like I say, two thousandths of an inch at most. Um, it does a great job if you're if you're complaining and having issues after a wide belt and you're finishing to say 180 and you're still seeing a lot of flaws in the wood surface um, you might want to look at potentially using that platen properly and check that see what your depth of cut is and and i don't know if we'll talk about this today but there is a method for running through to see what each head's removal rate is and then you can make those adjustments accordingly that would be my recommendation for setting up the machine properly okay so uh, our third picture here, we, we're going to talk a little bit about conveyor issues. In this picture that you've given us, uh, I see the, the conveyor belt is, is cracked, broken a little mm -hmm. bit, and it also looks shiny in the surface. What is all that about? So over time, uh, especially with normal wear, you're going to find that the conveyor belt will begin to um, become flat. It won't be, won't, won't be tacky anymore. It may not be pulling the material through quite like it needs to. Um, and if it's not maintained, uh, you can see dry rod and cracking issues, and that all will, will come into play over time, but it can be somewhat prevented. And we might talk about this a little bit in, in the maintenance side, but uh, typically with, uh, with a conveyor belt, you can use something as, as simple as simple green. Uh, just uh, an occasional spritz as the conveyor's running, uh, let that set on there for a little bit, and then uh, wipe all that clean you'll find that the simple green will help keep that rubber that's in the conveyor rejuvenated and less likely mm -hmm. to create those dry crack marks. Um, also, over time, because you have flat work pieces being used against it, uh, it may not become quite as tacky. The simple green will help some, but in some cases you need to um, rejuvenate your, your conveyor by actually running abrasive belt across it. And that can be that's a little tricky, but uh, a, a good operator who knows his machine can do this. Uh, if not, there there are some um, you know wide belt technicians that do service like that, or the manufacturer themselves. You can come have them come out and do a full work through for the machine. Um, it's it's pricey, but sometimes worth it because it keeps your expensive wide belt maintained and properly running. Uh, but the way that works is you would raise all of your uh, other rollers up, and you would slowly lower or raise your bed up to where that um, belt made contact. And it can be something as simple as a 120 grit. Uh, you can go lower, but I don't recommend it uh, because the, the more coarse you, you go, the more likely you are if you've got random grains sticking up too far uh, that can create problems on the conveyor. But uh, 120 is a good belt range to do that in. And it's a very slow process as you, you raise that up to where it makes contact. So we're just talking pretty much about a kiss passing this. As, if that, just just barely. I mean, this thickness is about all you need. Hmm. And I can see, you know, as you're thinking about a wide belt machine and all the different things that can happen, all the different things you have to maintain, how the uh, conveyor system can get completely overlooked as mm -hmm. far as maintenance is concerned. Yeah, and, and most of those are rubber, so they're, they're easy to keep maintenance. It's just the, the way to do it is just like with any machinery, and most companies don't do this. Set aside, you know, some time once a month at least uh, to do general maintenance um, on a machine. Weekly maintenance is, is more ideal, especially for your basic things like blowing out the inside of the cabinet, keeping the dust free, clean, keeping it clean and free of dust, excuse me. And... You know, just doing visual inspections weekly is crucial. A lot of this can be done just as part of daily maintenance and it doesn't take any more time out. But if you designate those times to run tests on your machine, you know, for, 
for equal um, thickness removal um, and, and doing, doing basic cleanups series, you'll find that it will prolong the life of your machine and keep it running smooth, which is the whole thing. Because it, when it falls apart, it falls apart when you're slammed and you, you can't afford to have your machine down. So if you do that preemptive maintenance, sometimes it makes all the difference in the world to, to prevent that from occurring. Hmm. Uh, wide belt tracking issues. Mm -hmm. We've dealt with this a good bit, and and you know it's the the quickest thing to do is think, well, well I've got a bad belt, mm -hmm. but more times than not, there's more to it than that. Yeah, I mean, there's a quick test you can see if maybe the belt's the issue, um, especially if it's got a tape joint. You can you can pull it off, rotate it around, and put it back on, and if it tracks off to the same side again, it's likely not the belt. Um, generally, that's going to be more something towards the machine. And what you can, there's a number of things to do. Um, the first thing you you ask, there's a lot of questions that we need to, to identify before we just start blaming one thing or another. And each of the answers to those questions will lead us down a path to maybe a different solution. So, you know, one of the things we look at is, you know, are you running cloth or paper? Uh, that does make a difference. And if so, what's your tension pressure? Um, ideally on, on paper, you're going to be somewhere around that 45 to 55 PSI range. Uh, if you are doing uh, sort of an X-weight cloth, 55 to 65, and then your heavier cloth, you can do 65 and above. Um, that's one thing we always check because a lot of times what we find is people over tension the belts. And when you over tension it, it's not allowing that belt to properly follow the the tracking the way it needs to and two it does affect your actual tracking mechanism because you've actually you've created so much pressure between that belt and what can happen on paper especially if it's over tensioned is it just rips um, but sometimes what will happen is it'll track off before that ripping can occur uh, so in my mind you know in the tracking system like that the more tension you would put on the thing the harder it would be for that tracking system to operate properly right um, and, and dust is another thing. Uh, if you check your little laser eye or whatever your mechanism is in your machine uh, that, that reads where your belt is actually tracking at, if, they're, if the inside of your cabinet is completely coated in dust, um, you, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna be able to, to properly track your belt. So it's, it's naturally gonna allow it to oscillate off the, the head. And so keeping the inside dust free, again, it goes back to general maintenance. Um, mm. and that'll make a world of difference. And of course, there are issues where belts are at fault. And there's ways we can sort of measure that and, and identify yeah. those you know, relatively quickly. Um, but it's a, it's a smaller percentage than, than the other factors are. Uh, your feed rate can make a difference. Uh, the depth of cut makes a difference. Uh, there's a lot of factors involved in that. You hit on, a, I think, a key point a few minutes ago. You talked about dust in the mm -hmm. system. And dust extraction, uh, I think we both come to realize, is a huge thing in a wide belt machine. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into it as far mm -hmm. as uh, figuring out exactly how much dust extraction you need for your particular setup. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, every manufacturer is going to have different requirements at their machine, depending on wh what kind of machine you're running. Uh, but generally, it's right around 1,000 CFM. So... If you've got a lot of other gates open in your shop, that can prevent your machine from actually having enough uh, CFM to pull out that excess dust. I mean, remember, you're, you're, sha you're, you're shaving dust here, you're not creating chips like you would with some other tooling. So that dust is very fine. And if it's not evacuated, then it gets electrostatically charged and starts trying to bond itself to the machine, to your workpiece, to the abrasive. And so being able to pull it out effectively is, is crucial part of the, the deal. Uh, talking about uh, wide belt sizes, uh, you know, we get a lot of uh, requests in here for some strange sizes in wide belts, mm -hmm. and we get a lot of requests for variations in standard sizes by an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch, whatever the case may be. So when you're considering a wide belt machine, how much tolerance is there or how much adjustment do you have in the wide belt machine itself? Uh, in regards to size. Can you go a quarter of an inch too long in a wide belt or, or a half an inch too narrow? What's the deal with that? Uh, ideally, you don't want to go too much narrower than, than the, the, the best answer to that question is, is get with your manufacturer because every manufacturer will give you a range of length and a width. And I would stick as close to that as possible. 
because if you start veering outside of that, you start you start affecting the the tracking capabilities. You also affect the tension capabilities. So being able to get with your manufacturer, read your manual. I know we all get those manuals and we put them away, but but read that manual and find out what that requirement is, what the range may be, and and typically they'll give you a set number, and you know uh, if it's you know. 75 as the length, for instance, you've got some leeway either way. It's almost like a bandsaw. You got you got a, some fluctuation in that width, that length rather. It's not a set number that it has to be. You got some uh, freedom on either side of that. But if you stick to what the manufacturer recommends, then if you start having issues, you the manufacturer can't come back and say, well, you didn't follow our directions, so we're not going to stand behind the machine. Because mm. re remember, if you start breaking belts, You've got some pretty delicate components inside that machine, and then you've got abrasive just flapping around at, at crazy speeds, and it's randomly hitting those components. So making sure that you've got the right width, the right length, uh, is, is, is pretty crucial to making sure the belt's gonna stay the way it needs to stay. I've had a few reports lately about uh, wide belt machine companies that are recommending nothing but paper regardless of grit for their machines. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. I, I, know, I know here at Klingspore, we, we recommend that you go with a, a cloth back belt with a number four joint up to 120 grit. Anything beyond that, we move to paper in the number one joint. But can we do that? Can we go paper all the way through? Absolutely. I mean, you could use paper um, the whole way through. The key is what's the, the first head on your machine if it's a metal drum, not a not a rubber drum, uh, then you really you need to be using cloth uh, because essentially you're just you're crushing that grain against the the, the metal drum. Uh, but if it's a if it's a rubber, even the harder durometer rubber, you can you can still use paper. I know people do that a lot of times for economy re economic reasons. They're trying to save some money. But the thing you got to realize if you're using an 80 grit you really don't want to paper anyway because you're typically asking that 80 grit to do a lot of work mm -hmm. on your removal and paper's just not going to hold up. So if you're going through, you know, four belts in the 80 grit that are paper, if you went with cloth, you would probably see that, that reduced down drastically and you'd see the cloth would last a lot longer. Uh, it's more durable. It's got more stretching capabilities. And typically there are some things that we can do with cloth that you can't do with paper that, that will help prolong that. So I recommend at least at least through 80 grit, maybe 100 grit, you just stick with a cloth. It's going to perform better for you. 120 and above, you can easily go to paper and then start your finishing process because cloth is designed for removal. Paper is designed for finishing because it's flatter, whereas cloth is interwoven. So those are kind of kind of my way I look at it is, is use your cloth for the removal rate, stick with paper for your, for your finishing process. Well, Chris, it's been uh, real enlightening. Uh, I could sit here and pick your brain for another hour. This is kind of fascinating stuff in my mind anyway. I know a lot of people might not be fascinated by it, but uh, I'm kind of wood nerdy that way, I guess. But uh, we appreciate you coming by and uh, maybe we'll do this, revisit this again in the future. Um, once again, if you have questions for us you would like to send in regarding this subject, any, any of the episodes we've had in the past, or something that might be coming up in the future that we might send a notification out about, uh, send us an email at techtalk at clingspore.com. Once again, techtalk at clingspore.com. We'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you for joining us. Tune in again next time, and please like and subscribe to our channel.